cling to what is good. I'm sure you heard the Apostle Paul saying uh, this in the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 9. And then you may wonder, what does it mean to cling to what is good? How can I cling to that what is good? And uh, Paul gives us uh, the whole explanation of how we should be clinging to that what is good. And let me just read to you uh, so that you can be able to understand. Now, in the book of Romans, chapter 12, from verse 9 to 21, it says, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is uh, evil and cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business. Hmm? In business, if you're a business person, don't be slothful. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute the, you. Bless and cast not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. I know there are people who, when you see a friend is rejoicing, you're like, oh, no, I don't. Ah, oh, this person is... Come on. Rejoice with those who are rejoicing and weep with them that weep. And verse 16 tells us, be of the same mind one towards another. Mind not high things, but consent to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. You see, people, most of the time, they are minding high things. And when you mind high things, you will definitely have to press someone down for you to go high. You'll have to step on someone. So the Bible says, don't mind high things. Consent to men of low estate. That's the most important thing. And uh, it continues and says, recompense to no man evil for evil and provide things honest in the sight of all men. But if it be possible, as much as life in you, live peacefully with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath for it is written vengeance is mine and i will repay says the lord therefore if thine enemy hunger feed him if he thirst give him a drink for in so doing you shall heap calls of fire on his head and be uh, and uh, be not overcome of evil but overcome evil with good these are powerful words that uh, the apostle told us the apostle paul and uh, basically, it is all about clinging to what is good. Do what is right and avoid what is bad. Now, when you look at that, uh, that passage in the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 9, where we just read, this, this passage contains a series of short appeals in which the Apostle Paul urges Christians to live together as a Christ's body by putting sacrificial love into action. Just the same way Jesus sacrificed himself for us while we were yet sinners. Sacrifice yourself for others. I, I'm not meaning people should go and kill themselves on the cross. Eh? But I mean sacrifice. Be a living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice like Jesus died. Okay, Be a living sacrifice. Sacrifice yourself as you live All right, for others. He begins with this plea. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. So now, when you look to this, how many times do we have love which is not sincere? Maybe you love someone because you know they'll give you something back. Maybe you're doing good to someone because, you know, uh, there's something that you expect from them. Paul says, no, love should be sincere. You love someone, let it be sincere. Hate that which is evil and cling to what is good. And Paul points out that true believers love genuinely without hypocrisy and overcome evil with good. How many times did Jesus overcome evil with good? They hated him, but he loved them. He did not say, I'm not going to die for those who are piercing me right now. No, Jesus died for everyone, including those who pierced him. Everyone, even those who spit on him and those who whipped him, if after that they could have gotten saved, immediately they're going to paradise, to heaven. He didn't really care if they're evil or, 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 or good. He loved everyone sincerely, genuinely. And the term for 
good in the original language speaks of moral excellence. The verb translated cling to means to stick or to hold together and resist separation or to join, to unite, or to embrace. And some Bible versions say, hold fast or hold tight to what is good. When Paul told the Roman Christians to cling to what is good, his desire was for them to embrace moral goodness with all of their beings, or in other words, to love it. And the godless, the godless world that you are living in basically just hate what is good. Let's look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3. The Bible says, They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. And they will be cruel and hate what is good. This is how the world works. They just hate what is good. When you tell people, Hey, don't do what is wrong. Don't be corrupt. They tell you, Hmm, you're trying to pretend that you're... you." <laughs> like there's a guy here in Kenya who is always called Deputy Jesus by... Just the fact that he's, he's, uh, he's, he controls morality in the, in the country because he's the head of uh, you know media and stuff and then he doesn't want what is wrong. And then people are always laughing and say, hey, you pretend to be a deputy Jesus. You see, people just don't like what is right. They want to do what is wrong all the time. And uh, they don't really care what the Bible says. That's the nature of the world. You should not be like that. Because God's children are lovers of good. We hate evil because it is the enemy of all that is good. God himself is good and the source of all goodness. Like the Bible says in the book of Mark 10, 18, And Jesus said unto him, Why callest me thou good? There is none good but one that is God. He was basically saying it is only God who is good. He was talking this in the aspect of being man. All right, We know that God, Jesus is good, definitely. But he was speaking in the aspect of man, humanity. There is no human who is good except God. So we only cling on the goodness of God. All right? Everything God creates is very good in every aspect. Everything is very good in every aspect. Because God created everything himself and so it was good. In the book of Genesis 1 verse 31, the Bible says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Mm, okay. So now, our goodness as believers, our righteousness or moral excellence, starts by being made right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. You can't be good unless you're right with God. Because you're taking the goodness of God and applying it on yourself. So how can you say you're good by your own, by your own goodness? It doesn't work. All right? The Bible tells us in the book of Psalms 14 verse 3, they are all gone aside. Everybody, we have all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. If it's me or you, my friend, we have fallen. We have fallen the taste. We have failed this test. There is nothing good that we can do. All right? We can only be good through the goodness of God. And the book of Romans Chapter 3 verse 22 tells us even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. The righteousness of God is by faith of Jesus to all of us. So the goodness of God, if you want to be good, if you want to be righteous, <laughs> you can be half righteous. You can be full righteous through the righteousness of Jesus. Or if it's your own righteousness, then uh, my friend you're doomed okay you're doomed if you go if you're using your own goodness mm -mm. the righteousness of god is all that you need and uh, the bible tells us for christ is the end of law for righteousness to everyone that believes so once you get saved you no longer need the law why don't you need the law because now the law was just our schoolmaster to bring us to christ but now once we are saved then we don't no longer need the law we now are righteous. The law is for the unrighteous. It is only a child who doesn't know what is right from wrong, who is given instructions. Let me give you a good example. Think about it. When you are young and your father could leave, uh, you know, uh, the car at the parking and then he could uh, maybe put uh, the car keys at the drawer and, and give instructions and say, 
I should not find anybody who has taken the keys and maybe uh, driven my car. Okay, I will. I will. I'm going to to pinch someone here who will. Who, anybody who's going to use the car will face my wrath. These are my rules. Okay, and it goes. So you, as a child, you could not touch that car. But what happens the moment you grew up and you, you're like 18, 20 years and, and all that, 16, and uh, now you have knowledge and now you are mature and now you have come to some knowledge, you understand how to drive, you understand uh, things, and then your father leaves the car keys in the drawer and uh, you want to go to the mall and do something. Are you going to be afraid of driving the car? No, because you're mature. And even when your father comes and finds you have driven the car, he will tell you, okay, oh, you went to the market. Oh, nice. You can even call them and tell them, hey, dad, I'm at the mall. I'm with your car. I'll bring it later on today. Because of what? You have matured. Rules are for the people who have knowledge. No knowledge, sorry. If you don't have any knowledge, you don't know the truth of the gospel, then rules are for you. The law is for you. The law is for the unrighteous. But the moment you become righteous, the moment you know God, then uh, why do you need rules? <laughs> why do you need rules, my friend? You don't need rules. The Bible tells us clearly, clearly, absolutely clearly. Let me read for you again. Romans 10 verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law. What is law? Rules. For righteousness to everyone that believes. Now you're righteous. The moment you believe, you're righteous. You're clean. So Jesus looks at you. It's just like your father. He looks at you and says, Oh, no, that's that's my son. Now we're in the same level. He can drive my car. He can drive my car. No, we're in the same level. We have the same understanding, the same righteousness. Let him drive my car. Come on, he's, he's, he's now a big person. He's not the uninformed boy. God has made Jesus Christ our righteousness. All right? We don't work by our own righteousness. We work by the righteousness of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30, it tells us, But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. 2 Peter 1 verse 1 tells us, uh, it says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> you see the point here? So, the righteousness is of Jesus. Okay? And Second Corinthians also tells us in 5 verse 21, For he has made him to be seen for us. Who knew no sin that we might be made what? The righteousness of God in him. Jesus was made sin. He was not supposed to die. What did Jesus do? He did nothing. Jesus did not sin. So why did he die? And uh, the wages of sin is death. It is only sinners who are supposed to die. Jesus was not a sinner. Then why did he die? He replaced himself with you. He took your death and you took his life. And that makes all the difference. That's why you need to believe that Jesus died for your sins so that you can be forgiven. And then now you can walk in righteousness and you stop walking as per the law because the law kills, my friend. If you're still looking forward to the law, the law kills. It will kill you. Once we are made... Uh, right with God through the blood of Jesus and our faith in him, we continue to seek and to hunger and to thirst for his righteousness by clinging to what is good. All right? The Bible told us in the, the book of Matthew chapter 5 verse 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. When you hunger for righteousness, have you ever hungered for righteousness? Let me ask you. I'm sure... Sometimes you sit down and uh, you feel and you say, God, I just want to do right. I just want to walk in your ways. I know life is so hard. Sometimes I can't do it by myself. It feels so hard for me to do this and that, but I really hunger. And you tell God, God, please, you know my weakness. You know my weakness. You know, I can do this. I have this and this addiction. I have this and this problem. I have this and this thing which is pulling me back. But Lord, you know me. Please, I'm hungering for you. 
And the Bible tells you, Blessed are those which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Hungering means you're lacking something, but you're looking for it. You're seeking something. You don't have it because you can't hunger when you have food. No. You can't thirst when you have water. No. So the Bible says, you are blessed if you're looking for that. Okay? You're really blessed because you will get it. Seek and you will find me. Alright? And also when you look at uh, Matthew chapter 6 verse 33, it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God. First, what should you seek? The kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Everything will be added unto you. Just seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek what is right. And God is going to say, okay, this is my son. This is my daughter. She has desire to please me. She has desire to do what is right. Now, let me just add everything else. Because God says, I will provide your needs. Not your wants, but your needs according to my riches and glory. You see the point? God provides for us. And he said, he told us very well that uh, will warring add an hour to your life? God knows what you need even before you ask him. Even before you start closing your eyes and saying, God, please, I need my rent. Lord, I, I need some food. He already knows you need them because he's your father. And he said very well, if you being evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give to those who love him, those who seek him, those who seek after righteousness? How much more is he going to give you? Hmm. And you're there still all worried. Oh, I won't read the Bible today because I'm really, I'm rushing so that I can make this deal. God tells you, come on, seek the kingdom of God first. Everything else, he will fix it. People will call you even when you're at home and fix those business deals for you. Because God knows your, your purpose, your goal, number one goal is to please him. He will feed you even as you sleep. Trust you me, he will. He will do that. The Bible says you pray and you don't get it because you pray with evil intentions. You pray and you tell God, God, please, I, I, I need this latest Mercedes Benz so that I can show people uh, 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 the haters. Uh, come on, come on. What you're praying, God will only give you your needs. He doesn't provide your wants. Everything else is in heaven. The riches and the enjoyments is in heaven. Now, he, we're only occupying till he comes. We only occupy till he comes. And... uh when we hold tight to God, he works his righteousness in us. And when we cling to what is good, when we love God and stick close to him, we can trust that he's transforming us from within, teaching us his good and perfect will and working everything in our lives for good. Because the Bible says in Romans 8.28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. Let me give you a good example to know that all things work for good. You, you maybe have wondered, just like, for example, uh, remember the story of Joseph and his 12 brothers, 11 brothers? You know, Joseph might have wondered, what did I do to my brothers to deserve all this? Why are they hating me, actually? I did nothing bad to them. Why is the society, is my friends, is my family, why are they doing like this? They sold him. They, they actually first threw him into a pit. And I'm sure when he was in the pit, he was wondering, now what have I done to deserve this? And minutes later, they sold him as a slave. And he wondered, why? What have I done, Lord? And he was sold in Egypt. And then he went. And then Potiphar's wife is coming, tempting him. And then he wonders, God, why do I have to pass through all this temptation? Within no time, he's thrown into jail. He may wonder, why all this has to happen? But you see, everything works for good to those who put their trust in God. Everything works for good. It purely works for good, my friends. And... uh 
the story of Joseph and how all that happened and then later on he's uh, crowned the leader in, uh, in Egypt and uh, you know a lot of glamour and all that when he was back home probably he could not have seen the whole stairs but God does not show you the whole picture to the end because he needs you to have faith. He shows you one stair after another one stair. He doesn't show you the whole ladder, the whole stairs to the end. Oh, he'll show you one part. Then he shows you another part. Why? Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. You need to have faith. There are people who sometimes, when things go uh, south and you know things just go bad, on them they say oh there is no god i cannot believe god could do this ask yourself but all things work for good to those who put their trust in god are you putting your trust in god are you doing what is right then everything is working for, for good so relax relax my friend relax okay and the early church fathers uh for example like the uh father augustine of uh, hippo Back in the days, he said, and I quote, It is good for me to stick close to my God. This will constitute the perfect and eternal wisdom, as it will constitute the truly happy life, because to obtain is to attain the eternal and supreme good, and to stick close to God forever in the sum of our good. Now, <laughs> this, these are just... Um, some people's quotes eh? i'm not taking them as like that's the is the lord i'm just saying they're just talking about we need to stick close to god how many times are we sticking close to god how many times are we doing god's will and and we understand even paul himself he advised the thessalonians to test all things by god's moral standard and only hold on to what is good and stay away from every kind of evil hmm we should stay away from every kind of evil. He told us in the book of uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, 5.21 uh, to 22, it says, But test everything that is said. Hold on to what uh, is good and stay away from every kind of evil. Stay away from every evil. All right. He told the Roman believers not to copy the behavior and customs of this world, but to be transformed into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will be able to learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. All right? Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Be transformed to a new person. All right? God warned the people of Israel to turn away from their corrupt behavior and do what is good Amos 5.14 do what is good and run from evil so that you may live then the, then the Lord God of heaven's armies will be your helper just as you have claimed alright are you claiming that God is your helper look at the world today the world that you're living in people are still claiming that uh, you see so and so will help me in this I don't put my trust in God. I put my trust in science. Have you heard people saying that? Oh, trust science. Come on. Have we gone to that point that now we no longer trust God? We want to put our trust in science. We want to put our trust in people. I'm not saying that we should not, uh, you know, uh, check out what is happening. and uh, you know, we, we, But your trust, there's something called trust, my friends. God is where who we should put our trust in is not in innovations is not in things you see somebody can say oh uh, for security purposes uh, we need to make some guns so that when an enemy comes we have our gun to you know we can shoot an enemy but uh, ask yourself that gun that you created and put your trust in that gun it is more so probably going to be used by the same enemy when he steals it from you to kill you so <laughs> you see <clears throat> God is the one that you should put our trust in not in things not in situations not in our education not in our knowledge not in our things put your trust in him even when Jesus was sending his disciples 
when Jesus was sending his disciples, he told them, go, don't carry money, don't carry your bag, don't carry anything. Just go, go and preach. I'll provide for you as you go. Why was he telling them that? So that they can put their trust in God. They can pray and say, God, uh, God, today I've finished my mission. Uh, help me and show me how, how I'm going to eat. God, provide for me my bread. Provide for me this, where I'm going to sleep. Provide for me this and that. And God will always provide. Because even Jesus asked the disciples when they came back, when you went, did you lack anything? They said, no. Did you lack anything? No. Why? Look at the society today. When pastors or maybe missionaries want to go out, how many times do they go by faith? I know, of course, uh, this is not the time we're using donkeys, huh? but uh, how many times do you sit down and tell God, God, I want to go and preach to people in a certain area. Provide for me the means. He may not give you the money, but he may send someone to give you a free ride. He may tell you to live in a... He may send someone who will accept you in their home and you go there and you stay there and you preach in the community. You see, money is not everything. Trust in God is everything. All right? And uh, we understand God warned people of Israel to turn away from their corrupt behavior and do what is good. And if they will, if they will go against the prevailing corruption by hating evil behavior and clinging to what is good and righteous, if they would defend justice instead of trampling on it, the Lord will stand by them as their defender rather than as their judge. He said that in the book of Amos 5, 10. He said, They hate him that rebuketh in the gate, and they abhor him that speaketh uprightly. For as much therefore as your treading is upon the poor, and you take from him burdens of wheat, you have built houses of hewn stone, but shall not dwell in them. And he continues and says, And uh, you have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink wine of them. For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins. They afflict the just. They take a bribe and they turn aside the poor in the gate from their right. That's God speaking. Speaking to these people. He told them, you either stay on my side, you're either with me or you're on their side. There is no staying at the middle point. And the same way, similarly, Paul asserted that those who keep on doing good, seeking after the glory and honor and immortality that God offers, the Lord will give them eternal life. But he will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for themselves, who refuse to obey the truth, instead live lives of wickedness. He said exactly that in the book of Romans 2, 7, 8. Just go and read there. And uh, God's son, Jesus Christ, is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. As uh, the Bible says in uh, John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And his life and death are ultimate examples of what it means to put uh, sincere, sacrificial love into action. Jesus gave his life uh, uh, to free us from every kind of sin to cleanse us and to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. As the Bible tells us in the book of Titus 2.14, he gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. That's why he gave his life for us, to make us his people, which are committed to good deeds. So if you have the life of Christ and you don't go do good deeds, then uh, are you really Christ-like? You see, Ephesians 2.10 tells us, for we are his workmanship created unto good works. That's why he created us to do good, to live like him, to be transformed into his image, into his style. But if you don't do what is right, then are you really Christ-like? You see, salvation is not by works. It is by faith only. But then after we get the faith, 
then we should do some good works. That's why the uh, James, he said that faith without action is dead. He didn't mean that action or works give you salvation. No, it means faith without works, without showing good works, then it means that faith was fake. If I say that the wind is going to the to the east and I can't see uh, papers going to the east or papers or or, or, or trees bending to the east, then uh, that that prediction is fake. How can I say the wind is going to the east and the, I can't see any evidence of it going to the east? How did you know? That's exactly how salvation is like. You should show some. When you say you're a Christian and you hate. You live with hatred, you live with lies and malice, and you are an evil person. The Bible says, let anyone, everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Should stay away from iniquity. And by doing good deeds and showing kindness and sacrificial love to others, we prove that we are the children of God. Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good, is from God and anyone who does what is evil has not seen God the third John 1 verse 11 says beloved follow not that which is evil but that which is good he that doeth good is of God but he that doeth evil has not even seen God also the book of James 3.13 says who is a wise man and endures with the knowledge among you let him show out a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom are you saved by works no but works are a representation they are evidence of true salvation of true faith so we need to cling to what is good so that we can that good can draw us into a closer relationship with christ which in turn results in christ-likeness of character all right first peter 2 uh, 21 it says for god called you to do good even if it means suffering just as christ suffered for you he's your example and you must follow his steps so to wind up i will say that we cling to what is good by clinging uh, clinging to the lord jesus christ in us is all the goodness we need to be holy full or holy good, all right? And uh, that's the end of our today's Bible study lesson. Hope it was a blessing to you. Hope you did learn something. And remember, you can always download this podcast and listen later offline or to share to your friends and family. And please don't forget to favorite our podcast and uh, subscribe to our channel so that you can always be notified whenever we post a new Bible study lesson. And if you'd like to get saved or you need a step-by-step Bible verses on the order of salvation so that you can well preach to your friends or family or maybe you just feel led to support our ministry or to buy some cool Christian merchandise. Kindly visit our website keithmoki.com for more details and breakdown. Otherwise, I hope to see you soon in the next one.